We have a more uh, interactive, workshoppy kind of uh, talk, presentation, demonstration um, with Jennifer oh, Cook, who's uh, a lecturer at the University of Birmingham, um, and Rosie no. Eady, I believe, um, from also from Birmingham, or have you come from? Oh, Birkbeck. Okay, sorry, um, in in the in London. Um, <clears throat> so they will be showing us a little bit about how we can use sensor technology, and in particular these. Um, now what's become ubiquitous, inertial movement unit sensors, these accelerometer and gyroscopes embedded in smartphones and tablets and watches. And they give us today very, very high precision information about movement, which can teach us a lot about how an individual or a, or a particular classification of individuals uh, is moving. So without further ado, I'll pass over to you. Okay. All right. So, um, some, yeah, something a little bit different now. Um, um, not right now, maybe later. Um, so what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes is we're going to break our time down into 10-minute blocks. In the first 10 minutes, you're going to do some data recording using the app on your smartphone. And then I'm going to talk very quickly through some of uh, mine and Rosie's research findings while Rosie speedily analyzes some of the data. And then, if everything goes to plan, <laughs> in the last 10 minutes, Rosie's going to talk through some of the data that we'll have collected at the beginning. OK, so uh, get, get out your smartphones and open up your Sensor Kinetics Pro app. And you should see a screen that looks something like this. The first thing that we want you to do is to take this slider here and slide it all the way to the right so that it's on 100 hertz. And then you can press on this icon here, and you should see a screen that looks something like this. So. In a minute, you're going to actually do the recording, but I'm just going to talk you through it first, and then I'll put some instructions up on the screen. So what we're going to ask you to do is to attach your smartphone to your ankle, if you can, using a spare scarf or a sock or something. If you can't, don't worry. Maybe just hold it in your hand and wave it around a bit. But ideally, attach it to your ankle. And walk five paces. Turn around. Walk five paces back to where you came from and repeat that process ten times. Then, I'll give you some time to do this in a minute. Then, <laughs> you um, need to ask your colleague to press stop on your smartphone. And then you need to press on this little arrow in the corner and press on files and sharing. And Save your file with a memorable file name. So I recommend your age followed by your initials. If everyone can do it like that, it will be easier for me to analyze it. That would be easier. <laughs> so ideally, put an age in if you want to keep your age confidential <laughs> and some initials and remember what they are. Um, press on Save. And then press on CSV Format. And this will bring up an email. And ideally, hopefully this works for at least a few people, we would like you to email your results to Rosie. And this is her email address. I'll put it up on the screen in a minute. And so Rosie's going to receive that data on her laptop so that she can quickly analyze it while I talk. So these are the instructions. And I'm going to time you on my iPhone for 10 minutes. And I want you to just go at it. Just go through these instructions. Me and Rosie will walk around and we'll try to help you out and hopefully we'll get some data. So, go. <laughs> Okay, 
let's, um, <laughs> let's move on. OK, so uh, Rosie tells me that she's already got some data. Look, you can see her already working away at trying to get some analysis going. So while she's doing that, I'm going to talk you through some of our research findings. So back in 2013, we um, did a study where we attached a motion tracker to participants' hands. And we basically asked them to swing their arm around their body. And we did this for high-functioning adults with autism and typical um, age and IQ matched controls. And the aim of the study actually wasn't to look at movement kinematics. But when we looked into the data, we saw these really interesting findings. And what we saw was that for the participants in autism, and you can see them in red and the controls are in blue, we saw that they accelerated up to a higher peak velocity. They had steeper acceleration and deceleration slopes. And overall, throughout the movement, they more, made more jerky movements. And so what all this information tells you when you put it all together is that whereas our typical controls were moving in a very smooth and fluid manner, the participants with autism that we worked with were making this movement in a more jerky fashion. So they were accelerating up to a higher maximum velocity and then basically needing to slam the brakes on. And one thing that we thought was actually really interesting about this was that we also saw a correlation between the jerkiness of the movement and total ADOS score. Now, I know this is just a few participants, so you shouldn't you know, make any strong conclusions based on a graph like this. But it made us start to think about something that became important in our future work. And what we started to think about was the idea that the person that's doing their ADOS score, so this is a face-to-face -face interview where you basically assess the quality of the social communication between two people. And normally the person that's doing the scoring doesn't have a diagnosis of autism. But these people on our graph, they do have a diagnosis of autism. So we thought, well, what if it's the case that the person that doesn't have autism actually finds it very difficult to read the emotions and the mental states and to kind of understand what the movements mean, the movements that are produced by the people with autism. What if they just don't really get these movements? And so this is what we've been looking at in some of our more recent work. Obviously, we're not the first people to think that movements tell us interesting things about what's going on inside a person. For example, many people, when they watch a stimulus like this, they start to think about mental states. They start to make up a story where one of the triangles is coaxing the other one out of the enclosure. But many people have argued that individuals with autism are less likely to make up these types of stories. But Rosie and I thought, well, when you look at these animations, these are smooth, fluid movements. This animation is made by a graphic designer who doesn't have a diagnosis of autism. So what would happen if we asked people with autism to make their own triangles animations and then we showed them to other people with autism? Would they then be able to mentalize about these animations? So we did this, um, much to Rosie's um, detriment in a way, who had to take a whiteboard off the wall of the office and hang it down and hang a video camera over the top of it. It was a bit of a complicated setup. Um, but we asked a group of high-functioning adults with autism and a group of age and IQ matched controls to make their own triangles animations. And we asked them to produce animations that depicted coaxing, mocking, seducing and surprising. The first thing that we did with these animations was to track the kinematics of the nose and the tail of each of the triangles. And when we looked at this kinematic data, we found that, like our previous study, participants with autism, and you can see them in red here, moved their triangles in a significantly more jerky way compared to the typical participants who didn't have autism. And it didn't matter whether you were talking about the coaxing, mocking, seducing, or surprising video. What we really wanted to know, though, was what would happen if we brought in a perceiver group and we showed these people the videos that our participants had produced. Well, when you do this, if your perceiver group are typical controls who don't have autism, and you show them videos 
made by other people who also don't have autism, then they're very good at guessing what the mental state is in the video. So they're very good at figuring out what the person was trying to show in the video. However, if you take typical controls and you show them videos produced by a person that has autism, then they can't read the video. So they're very inaccurate in guessing what the mental state is. So in a way, we, we were right in our prediction that people that don't have autism actually find it quite difficult to read and to mentalize about the movements of people that do have autism. The really interesting question is what happens when you take people with autism and you show them videos made by somebody else with autism. And unfortunately, we didn't find that that conferred any sort of benefit. So our participants with autism um, were not very good at guessing the mental states in the videos made by other people with autism or in the videos made by typical controls. However, Looking back at the data, we realized that within our autism sample, we had quite a lot of variance in the movement kinematics. So if we selected at random two participants from the autism group, then there was a high probability that they would actually move really differently from each other. But if we selected at random two participants from the control group, then they normally moved quite similarly to each other. So in our ongoing research, what we're trying to look at now is what happens if we can match up two people with autism that move in quite similar ways to each other, does that confer some sort of benefit in terms of reading each other's movements? Now, movements aren't just important in understanding mental states, but also in many other things, as we've seen today, including um, estimating other people's internal emotional states. So many of you from looking at this top um, stimulus might think that this is an angry walker and this bottom one you might think that this is a more sad walker. However, in our recent work we thought, well, presumably it makes a difference whether you normally walk in a fast way or in a sad way. Uh, <laughs> fast way or a slow way. So if you're always charging about in life with this fast gait, then maybe when you look at this stimulus at the top, that just looks completely normal to you. You don't think that's angry at all. But if you're normally walking about with a slow gait, then maybe when you look at this fast one, that looks extremely angry. So we tested this using exactly the same technology that you have used today. So Rosie went out and um, got people to attach their smartphone to their ankle and recorded them walking up and down so that she could figure out the mean walking velocity for a whole bunch of participants. And I'm going to show that on the x-axis. And then Rosie showed participants stimuli that were similar to the ones that I've shown you here, a bit more tightly controlled stimuli. These are kind of the show stimuli. Um, and she asked participants to rate on a scale from 1 to 10 the extent to which these stimuli depicted an angry, a sad, or a happy gait. So what we predicted was that if you had a participant that was typically a slow walker, then when they see the fast walking stimulus, they would think that that was intensely angry, so they would score very high on this scale. Whereas if you have a participant that's typically a fast walker, then when you show them the fast stimulus, that will just look completely normal to them. So they won't say that it's particularly angry. So we predicted to see this negative correlation. And indeed, that's what we saw. And we also saw this for sad movements as well. So to summarize the whistle-stop uh, tour of some of our research, um, what I've argued is that movements are very important in understanding another person's internal mental state and emotional state. And that two people that move very similarly to each other might have actually have a benefit in terms of understanding each other's mental states and emotional states, whereas two people that move very differently to each other might find it more difficult to read each other's internal states. And therefore, all of this research that we've seen today about how people with autism might move differently from people that don't have autism becomes very important in terms of understanding their socio-cognitive uh, functioning. Do you want this? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not sure, th these haven't labelled quite how I wanted to, so I'm not sure who's walking this is, but this is whoever sent in um, some, some data 
this is some, some recordings of uh, your acceleration. Um, and I was going to just quickly run through how the, the iPhone works in order to, to get this information out. So embedded in the phone um, is an accelerometer, which um, it, your phone uses it, uh, so when you're on maps, to try and figure out where you are and if you're playing a game where you're tilting the phone, it's using that accelerometer to, to basically measure the force at which the phone is, is moving in, in relation to the, to the Earth's gravitational pull. Um, so what we're able to do is, uh, if you use this app to tap into that, you can then get a measure of the, the force in which um, somebody's leg or their arm is moving. And with some fancy analysis, you can pull out lots of different um, elements of the, of the kinematics of their movement. So these are just the, the traces of the movement. So this is just acceleration. So you can see, um, if you zoom in, uh, you get a bit of a detailed bit of a bit more detailed picture of each step and um, so each one of these um, up and down kind of squiggles is a step and that's the foot going in um, one direction and the app will actually work in three um, dimensions so you could get x y and z coordinates so you could actually look at each of these differently these are um, calculated across all three so this is 3d acceleration but if you're interested in um, sway or um, some different element of movement you can try and isolate that in a bit more detail um, and here's some that I made earlier <laughs> which you can kind of see a bit better how you can really start to pull out some of the elements of different movement patterns to try and get a much more detailed, fine-grained idea of the quality of movements and perhaps differences between people that you didn't necessarily, couldn't necessarily see just with the, the naked eye. <laughs> There's some pretty graphs. So, uh, thank you very much for that. We give a round of applause to Rosie um, and Jennifer for that wonderful demonstration. That was, that was really good.